Um, today I'm going to be talking about um, assistive technology for infants and toddlers ages 0 to 5 and why it's so important to introduce this population to assistive technology as soon as possible. Joining us today we have Miss Anne Chovey. She recently received her master's degree in special education and this is her first year in a preschool classroom. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, Deb. Uh, well, as you mentioned, this is my first year in a special education preschool classroom. And to put it simply, I am overwhelmed. The students have a range of disabilities and are functioning at different levels. I'm finding it difficult to include them all in the same activity. Plus, the parents are making requests for specific materials and equipment, and I don't have the funds to buy them. I'm very confused about which students need assistive technology and who pays for what. I'm hoping you can answer some of my many questions. Well, I hope I can too. But first, let me just make sure everyone here knows who I am and who, what I do. Um, I work at Parents Helping Parents in the iTech Center, and we offer many services here at our center. Uh, we are located in San Jose, California, and we offer training. We do have a service called a Tech Exploration, where we are vendorized with a regional center for children 0 to 3 years old and 22 and above for them to come in and do that Tech Exploration. We also do have a contract with the Department of Rehab for the older individuals. We provide consultations um, to district teams as well as to infant toddler teams. We provide information and referral. We don't do full AT assessments, but we do have a service we call assessment coaching. Um, so we can assist a team going through that process. We do have a speech therapist that works here. Um, um, so she has AAC expertise, which is wonderful to have. And we are a Proloco to Go Center, as well as a Don Johnston Ambassador Center, a T-Box Apps Center. Um, we also have a volunteer who adapts toys to switches um, for individuals. And we are, of course, a member of the AT Network of California. So hopefully today people will understand a couple of different things. First of all, how important it is to understand the need to consider appropriate modifications and adaptions for children 0 to 3, um, or actually 0 to 5. Also, how to understand how assistive technology can support a child's participation in their daily activities and routines, as well as receive an overview of different assistive technology tools for this age range. Okay, so Anne, where should we start? Well, Deb, I'm kind of embarrassed to ask, but could you tell me exactly what assistive technology is? Certainly, and for many of you this is a review, but I think it's always good to remember what the law says, what assistive technology is. First, it is a device. It's any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether acquired commercially off the shelf, modified or customized, that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of a child with a disability. The term does not include medical devices that are surgically implanted or the replacement of that device. Um, so that, and that's in the law. That's what the law says what assistive technology devices are. But it also says something about a service. Assistive technology in the law is also a service. It's any service that directly assists an individual with a disability in the selection, acquisition, or use of an assistive technology device. Now, you work in a preschool classroom, so there's also some information about what the law is for early intervention and assistive technology for the 0 to 3, 0 to 5 population. And in Title 17, it says, early intervention services means those services designed to meet the developmental needs of each eligible infant or toddler and the needs of the family related to the infant or toddler's development. The services include, but are not limited to, and the very first service they list is assistive technology. So it's very clear in the law that this age range assistive technology needs to be considered for these individuals. Okay, so I'm most interested in school age children. What does the law say about that? Well, let's go back to Part C, um, early intervention, ages 0 to 3. That's part of your classroom or maybe part of your classroom. So that's where the law comes in under Part C, early intervention, what I just said. 
But in IDEA 2004, it requires, and IDEA is Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it requires that assistive technology devices and services be considered for each student when developing the IEP, ages 3 to 22. Okay, so most of my students are between 3 and 5. Correct. So they would be covered under IDEA. Correct. All right, so are you saying um, that the school then has to pay for everything in terms of the funding? Well, it depends. Um, actually, it really depends on what the need is for that child. As you heard, assistive technology is just about anything it can be. And some of your students may need positioning devices uh, so they can better participate uh, positionally in your classroom. In that case, if they are a client of California Children's Services, or CCS, um, they will assist in paying for any positioning and mobility tools your students might need to be more functional in your classroom. Um, and that can also go for modifications for the to, to the toilet as well. Um, so when you think about mobility and positioning, think bigger with CCS than just seating. Um, if they're students under Medi-Cal, Medi-Cal pays for medical equipment and that does include some AAC devices. AAC is alternative and augmentative communication devices for those students who are nonverbal. Um, just to be clear, it does not pay for software or apps if somebody's using an iPad, but they can and will pay for, I'm sorry, it will pay for software and apps, but it will not pay for a laptop or an iPad. Mm -hmm. Reverse what I just said to you. Sorry about that. And also, if the student does have an IEP, which your students all yes, do, of course, do. Um, um, if they're not making adequate progress on those IEP goals, that's when AT should be considered. But finally, let's not, talk, let's not forget regional centers. And this is something that came out not too long ago about the Early Interventions Act. Um, and it does say here that notwithstanding any other provision of law or regulation to the contrary, effective July 1, 2009, with the exception of durable medical equipment, regional centers shall not purchase non-required services, but may refer a family to a non-required service that may be available to an eligible infant or toddler for his or her family. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly. Basically, it means that the regional center is your funder of last resort. Um, so what the families need to do is they need to access medical insurance, CCS, other sources first and be denied before regional center will consider covering an item the child might need to meet their IPP, their individual program plan, or in your case, the IFSP uh, goals, which are the regional center goals that they create. Okay. Okay. Can you back up for a minute, though? You, know, you said the law says that we need to consider assistive technology. What does that mean? How do we know if the child needs it or not? And when do we do this consideration? I'm confused about what that is. Well, we did, there's actually an entire webinar um, we've done recently for the AT Network on consideration. But in one oh. slide, <laughs> I should have attended that one. Should have. <laughs> in one slide, let me tell you what considering AT is. Consideration is something that should happen at every IEP meeting. Okay, and what does that mean? First of all, it assumes that team members have a knowledge of assistive technology. And there are four outcomes, possible outcomes, to that consideration process during the, an IEP. First of all, that AT is not required because the student is making adequate progress on their goals, so no AT is needed. And that just gets documented in the IEP. Second is that AT is required and specific devices are known. So you've already tried out some things, you know what you need for that child to meet the goal, and you just write those in. So things in my classroom that I'm using is exactly. the assistive technology? Correct. And you would write that in. So let's say you have a student who is low vision. You're using a magnifier that you happen to have in your classroom for that student. You want to write that in because without that tool, that student can't see or do the work adequately because perhaps the next classroom they go to does not have the magnifier available. So you want to make sure that student has that tool available from classroom to classroom if they need it to meet their goals. That's why you write them in. The third possible consideration outcome is that AT is required, but trials with different devices are needed to make that final decision. 
So you know the child needs a magnifier, but you don't know how high magnification they need or how large a magnifier will work best. So you're going to try out some different types of magnifiers for that child. Well, who's supposed to do this trialing of the tools? I'm pretty busy. Right, and that can be any IEP team member. That's a team decision as to who does the trials. Okay, and the final one is, of course, that more information is needed. You don't know what the child needs to be best, and that's when you would ask for more assistance and you would document in the IEP who is going to do what to try to get more information and then reconvene the IEP team after you've gotten that additional information. That could be an assessment, it could be contacting somebody to trial out some more tools. Um, it depends on what the need is, what the information is needed. Okay, uh, well, you know, it, it sounds like there's a lot more to know about the consideration process, so I might have to just research that a little bit right. more or go to that next time you do that webinar. Right. I think, yeah, go check out the webinar. I believe it's archived on the 18th. Okay. Website. Great. That sounds great. So let's just move on uh, maybe to more about AT itself and, and what it is. All right. Well, AT is a continuum. It goes from no tech to high tech. So when you're looking at um, these children, um, when you think you have a no or low tech assistive technology, you're going to look for something that is very simple, no electronics, easy to use, and easy to integrate into the day. So for example, you would take uh, big knobbed puzzles would be assistive technology. Uh, photographs that help with visual choice making could be assistive technology. Um, adding Velcro to an object to keep them on the table. That would be assistive technology, no tech. Okay. The mid-tech range of tech technology for this would be that maybe there's some electronics, maybe a little bit of training is needed, um, something like a single or a multi-step communicator um, that they could use, something pretty easy to use, but you know requires a little bit of training to use it appropriately. And then of course there's the high tech, which is high electronics, the iPads, the software, the computers. Um, that's really high tech and technology. But as you see, this is really a truly a continuum and that's what people need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and so why would you use AT with a young child? Well, it helps infants and toddlers and preschoolers to one, participate more fully in their daily family activities and routines, like um, helping to cook. Um, most toddlers love to be in the kitchen with mom and dad, so how can you help a child with a disability do that? Maybe with some AT tools, they could. Um, they can also help them play successfully with toys and other favorite objects, maybe with a big brother or sister or with a peer. Um, so they can be playing with their switch toy alongside their peer or their brother or sister. Um, and that encourages that social interaction. It also can help them communicate better their wants, their needs, and their ideas to different family members for those who are nonverbal. Well, it sounds like we're just helping them to become more independent. Exactly. That's the the long-term goal. Is it ever too soon to use assistive technology? Actually, no. Um, assistive technology should be introduced to a child as soon as a significant delay in functional skills or development is identified. So as soon as you see that a child is falling behind due to their disability, in a certain area, that's when you need to start considering using assistive technology so they can continue to develop in all areas to the best of their ability. Um, it should always be introduced as a part of their natural routine because children learn through play. I mean, it's not fun, they're not going to do it. Um, but oftentimes families and teachers get so caught up in the disability of the child, they get lost in what normal development and stages look like for typical children. So it's always important to remember what typical child development stages and milestones are. Um, and so here's a great website, the Kids Growth website, that kind of is a good reminder for families that, you know, your, your screaming two and a half year old may be screaming because they're a toddler who's two, not because they're having trouble communicating. Hmm. So it's just good to keep in mind, um, you know, what typical is. Right. That would be a great resource for um, the parents, my parents. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so tell me, if there are any particular children who can benefit more from assistive technology than others? Well, actually, it's many children can. Um, children who have motor challenges um, would absolutely benefit from assistive technology to adapt their world so they can access it better. Children who have difficulty expressing themselves verbally would also benefit from assistive technology to continue making their wants and needs known. 
children who have sensory issues, who have difficulty um, with loud noises, who have difficulty with tactile touch things, can absolutely benefit from assistive technology to help them feel more comfortable in their own body as they move through their world. Children with cognitive delays can benefit from assistive technology to help them learn things in multimodal ways um, to help encourage and increase their cognitive abilities. And children with limited social skills can also benefit from assistive technology to help them um, understand and learn social interactions with their peer group. Well, you've identified just about every child in my <laughs> class, Deb. But of course. Yeah. Uh, so will they use the AT outside of the classroom too? Absolutely. Um, assistive technology in this age group really needs to be integrated throughout the child's day. It is not, it should not be area specific. So it should be used in the home. It should be used in their daycare setting. If they're in an early intervention program, it should absolutely be used in that early intervention program site as well as the preschool program. So anywhere the child is, they should have their AT available to them if it helps them with their interactions, with their communication, with their access to their world. So we could go from home to school and school to home. Absolutely, because assistive te technology, again, what does it address? It addresses access to their environment. It addresses their motor skill needs. It addresses their language and communication needs. It addresses social skills and recreational needs as well as their cognitive needs and sensory concerns. So, and those are global. They happen in all environments. So AT needs to be available in all environments. Wow, well that all sounds great, but I don't even know where to start with my students. Can I give you an example? Absolutely. Okay, let's take Carlos. Uh, he's three and a half and he has Down syndrome. He has some fine motor difficulties and is basically nonverbal except for some sounds. So where should I start with him? Well, a uh, good place to start would be his IEP goals. Um, what is it that you want Carlos to do? Well, we want him to interact with his environment by engaging in play with a toy. And we also want him to communicate his choices during snack time. All right. So Carlos, to reiterate, is a three-year-old child. He has Down syndrome. And some of his IEP goals are that he will purposefully activate a cause and effect toy and that he will communicate his choice of snack items. Does that sound great? Yes. Okay. That's about right. So, let's, so what are the obstacles for him to, let's say, activating a toy? Well, he has difficulty because of uh, his fine motor limitations. He has a very weak grasp. Okay, so um, let's look at some switches for Carlos that might help him out. There's a lot of different switches out on the market. You might have some in your classroom that look an awful lot like a big red switch, which is um, on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, it's big and it's large and it's red. And it's very easy to find visually and it's very big and easy to, to, to target as well. But there's a lot of other kinds of switches out there um, for those students. For example, maybe Carlos can't actively hit a switch, but he can swipe his arm across effectively and easily. So maybe you want to get him a wobble switch where he just swipes across it. He doesn't have to push down on it. Actually, I have another student in mind for that one. Ah, so that's a good one. There's also other kinds of switches out there. So if a typical switch doesn't work, keep in mind the wide variety of switches that are available. But let's remember, if you have a switch, you need a toy, <laughs> something to activate that switch with. So for switch adapted toys, now there are ways of purchasing them. There's a lot of companies that you can purchase a switch activated or switch adapted toy from. Um, they're expensive. They can be very expensive. So you can also make your own. Um, there are instructions available on, on www.ataccess.org under the resource hub on how to make your own switch adapted toy. Or if you're in San Jose, you can always drop off the toy for $8 with our toy doctor who will adapt it for you, um, so which is a nice service that is offered by our center. But Again, if you're looking at Carlos, he has a weak grasp. So maybe you want to work with the occupational or physical therapist on using a switch to develop that motor skill for him. Um, there are switches that can work on finger isolation because he has to use his pointer finger to punch into a switch to activate a toy. There are 
switches that can work on pinching because you just squeeze the switch and it activates the toy, as well as gripping and, and, and well, squeezing, of course. So, you know, switches can also be used not just to activate a toy, but also to develop those fine motor skills those children need in a fun way. I think some of those switches would work great for Carlos. What about something to help him communicate his choices? Oh, there's a lot out there for that. Um, let me talk a little bit about where to find some of these things. There's a great website called enablingdevices.com. They also sell switch adapted toys at this website as well as they have a lot of different communication tools available. Um, one thing that might work for Carlos, depending on where he's at cognitively, is a grooved object communicator. It has three different switches on it and you can put the picture above the switch or the object or both depending on what the child can do. And then when he pushes the switch, it says out loud what that object or picture is. So you have the object, the picture, and the voice all available to him as he makes his choices. Wow, I think he could benefit from something like that as we're introducing him to icons for communication. Exactly, and yeah. To make that connection to the abstract. Perfect. Object. That would be great. So another one you think about is the Twin Talks communicator. And so this is just for two choices only. And they're side by side. And you put the picture on the plate and you push the, the switch and it says what you want that message to be. If he's much more mobile than that, if he's a runner, he's <laughs> active, <laughs> you may want to have a, a, a two switch thing that he can wear. So there is the hip talker where you can have two messages he wears around his waist in a hip talk. And he pushes the button on his around his waist, and it says the message out loud to him. So that way, he it's available to him at all times oh. if he's very active. That's another option, and that sure. can be expanded to up to 16 messages as he grows into it. Some other thoughts for if you're working specifically on where he's just at the table is maybe a cheap talk four, which is. Four messages are available on it, and this is also from enabling devices. And you can put the pictures with up to four messages available. The nice thing about Cheap Talks is they're also switch accessible. So if let's say he can't target each message individually, he can hit the switch, and the switch will go through the options. Um, and then when it hits the right option with a light around it, he can hit the switch, and then it'll say that option for oh, him. So it'll scan through the exactly. possibility. And then he could use that grip switch exactly. to work on his grasp. Exactly. Great idea. So another thing, since you said you're working on icons, is making a symbol-based board. Um, Mayor Johnson is a common place for what they call board maker symbols. But there's other places where you can get free symbols or take pictures in the classroom and make your own board with your digital cameras. Oh, um, and really personalize exactly. it with his to own pictures. Mm -hmm. Or even let him take the pictures. That could be fun oh. for him. Um, and idea. then he can create his own picture board to make choices from. And then, of course, you can always, if you have iPads available in your classroom, use an iPad with an AAC app. We're going to talk a little bit more about iPads and AAC and apps later. AAC, AAC Alternative Augmentative Communication. Okay. Okay, there's a lot of apps out there um, for this age group. And I'll talk a little bit about iPads for this age group in a little bit. Okay. What about other devices that could help him participate during circle time? Okay, well during circle time you want to have a device that can have multiple messages on it so that when he hits the switch it goes through um, a series of messages each time he hits the switch that are, can all be interrelated. Um, for example, the step-by-step, -step, an iTalk or a sequencer all do these different things. How would that work? Um, you, would, you would say, let's say you have a, a circle time song that you're doing with your classroom. Wheels and on the bus. Wheels on the bus is a favorite. Okay, so you want him to be able to sing Wheels on the Bus with everybody. And in these devices, this sort of device, you can record um, the song in different chunks. So if he hits the switch once, it'll say something like, the wheels on the bus go round and round. He hits the switch again, round and round, round and round. Hit the switch one more time. The wheels on the bus go round and round all through the town. So you see he's now participating in circle. You can also use it for different kinds of greetings with his classmates. So if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer greeting interaction, he can say, hey, how you doing? Great to see you today. What'd you do last night? 
to encourage that social communication as well. So there's a lot you can do with these. Right, I'm sure there's with lots it. of strategies that the speech therapist might have Absolutely. to use these um, really effectively. So uh, another thing you can do, though, for those with, with um, communication difficulty is have what I call put them around. And the voiceover mini voice recorders are pretty inexpensive. You can also get talking bricks from AbleNet. They do the same sort of thing. So just simple single message communicators, inexpensive, that you can put around your classroom. And studies have shown, for example, if you put one by the book area and the message you record is for all students, read me a story. Please. Please. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Um, you can have, the studies have shown that um, having that available in the classroom has increased the amount of reading being done to the students in that classroom because they have the ability to ask for a story to be read to them. So that's an actually really nice early literacy thing you can do easily in your classroom. Wow, there are lots of places in the there classroom are. for that. Absolutely. And then also by the door, if I have to go to the bathroom, you know, those sorts of things. For the runners, mm. I want to go outside before right. they take off. Lots of things you can do with those. And then finally, um, for the more advanced students, they do have devices that have more choices on them that have what we call levels within it. So you have, let's say, the talk for with levels is four choices available at any one time, but you can record different levels to it. So you have your four choices for snack time, and then you change the level, and then you have four different choices you've already recorded into it for circle time. So they have different levels already recorded into it. So you would change the overlay change on top the, right. to correspond to the level. Exactly. So oh. that might be something for the more advanced students. Right. Have something with levels oh, available. Oh, and it saves time exactly. too, for the, for the, the teacher mm -hmm. and the, or who's ever doing the recording. Wow, those are really good ideas. Um, I can see how um, those could be used in so many ways to help my students. Um, but what happens with the younger kids who don't have IEPs? Um, how do you know what the goals are for those kids? Well, before we go into the, that, I just wanted to check with other people if anybody else here had a student profile they wanted us to talk about. Because um, there are other people present. Sorry, Miss Angela. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's get, give somebody else a chance. Let's give someone else. Does anyone else Any have a student or a profile they want to bring up to us? Okay. Um, it looks like no one has any other students right now. If you do, just go ahead and pop something in the chat box, and we will be happy to um, uh, try to address that challenge. Um, and that's great. Um, so if not, why don't we talk more about the younger kids who don't have IEP? Okay. So you want to talk about those students in your class who just have the IFSP, the regional center, correct? Right. So um, let's I don't have really many, but they come in with right some, uh, with an IFSP. So how does that work? Yeah, together? all right. Exactly. So if a child is younger than three, they have something called the IFSP, which is an individualized service plan, and it's from their regional center. Um, let's take a look at uh, give me an example of, of Jordan. Okay, so let's take a look at Jordan. Um, Jordan is two, and he's been recently, she, sorry, has been recently diagnosed with autism. And um, some of his, uh, her, sorry, Jordan, IFSP goals are that she will willingly transition from one activity to another with minimal prompting, um, and that she will greet her classmates at her early intervention sites uh, during morning circle. Fairly typical sorts of goals, right? So these are the ISSP goals. Correct. Okay. They sound very similar to IEP goals. They do. Yeah. So, um, so how could we work with these with Jordan? Um, well, let's start with the uh, transition goal first for her. Um, there's a lot you can do to help these kids with transitions. Um, first, you can look at social stories. Uh, are you familiar with the social story? Uh, yeah. So, like a personalized story that helps a child understand a social situation or helps prepare them for a change in routine or a transition? Correct. And it's done in a very positive way. Instead of saying, you will not tantrum when going from one to another, you say, you will stand up, you will put, put your hands to your side, you will walk over to. So it's all done in a very positive way, emphasizing the behaviors you're looking for 
and not talking about the behaviors they may be doing at that time. Right, and I think a lot of times it's from the perspective of the child. Exactly. Like, I will stand quietly mm -hmm. and keep my hands to myself. Right, and if you need more information or some ideas on social stories, the graycenter.org is a great place to go to look at and find out more about those social stories. So maybe Jordan needs some social stories created to help her with her transition so she knows what her expected behaviors are. Um, so uh, we have here um, somebody who has some, another student um, who is low vision and also diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Um, still is nonverbal and throws things away after using them for a few seconds. Um, so it sounds like the issue is the throwing of things as opposed to being done. Um, at three, their attention span may be fairly low, so they may be throwing them um, when they're done because that's their way of saying, I don't want to do this anymore, which is a typical three-year-old behavior, but it's not very pleasant in your class. I think I have that student <laughs> in my class, actually. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? Um, you would have, you could, first of all, of course, look at that social story and see if that assists. You may also want to look at, depending on how low the vision is, uh, maybe a timer, a visual timer of some sort might assist that student to, you know, okay, well, and you can have the big, a big, large visual timer with the red, which may assist if they have some vision and might be able to see the red, and while the red is in play, they have to be doing that activity. When the red is all done, they're done, and they can put it away in a put-away box. Um, so you have a place where they would then put it away to show that they are done. And then they can go on to a preferred activity. So it's also a teaching strategy. So you're going to say, you're going to do this activity while the red is in play. When the red is done, you're going to put it away and you get to do a preferred activity. Mm -hmm. And you would start very small with just a few, maybe one minute. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a non-preferred activity. So you just have them start with like one minute with the red until they can see that relationship. When the red is done, I get to do a preferred activity. So, and then you would expand it slowly to the amount of time you want them working on that object. So there's some teaching involved as well as using the visual timer tool and the social story for that particular example. Um, let's say you have a student who maybe would benefit from a picture schedule. Um, this particular student with a vis low vision may not benefit from a picture schedule, maybe an object schedule which is another type of schedule. Well, and depending on the vision needs, because I've exactly. also heard that black and white icons that are blown up mm -hmm. to, you know, an appropriate size. size can be very, uh, very helpful in helping uh, with the vision right. and communicating what the expectation is. Exactly. So maybe a, a picture schedule would help so that, you know, they know that circle time is first, and then there's going to be some work time, and then when work time is done, it's play time, and then after play time, it's toileting time, and then after toileting time, we go to snack time. So they know what's coming, and then when they've completed an activity, they take that picture themselves off schedule and put it in the all done box or envelope, whatever they can do. So they get that reinforcement of the activity. Right. I think a lot of times it's just visually explaining what the expectation exactly. is because they're not hearing, hearing it. it. Fully, exactly. And also some students can benefit just from a transition object, being able to pick something up and carry it with them from place to place. Oh, like, like a, a blanket. Blanket. <laughs> Like a blanket, a book, a stuffed animal, something they can take with them from place to place to help them move from place to place. So these are some thoughts for that transition. Going back to scheduling, um, there's a lot of schedule boards. You can buy one. Um, the one here is from Enabling Devices that's on this, and it's blue, it's vertical, it's got wall, it's wall mounted, um, you have your different icons in it, they display seven three by three icons. You can have it talk, so when they press on it, it can say something out loud, or you can buy it without the audio, if they don't need the audio, and they just pull it and put it in the all done spot, which is at the very bottom of that board. But, you know, a lot of schools don't have a lot of money. Yeah, you're preaching <laughs> to the choir here. <laughs> so you can also make your own. Um, here's an example of somebody that made their own schedule board for uh, Joe. And um, here's, it's, basic, it's red, so it's big and visual. He used uh, printed icons held in place with three Velcro strips, and the finished envelope is at the bottom. So as, he go, as Joe goes through his day, he takes the icon, and he puts it away when he's completed that activity. And he can see what's next and it's big and bold and it's Joe's, so he knows where to go. 
some other thoughts for making your own is let's say you want something more at their desk or in their cubby. Um, maybe do it off a file folder, creating a file folder to depict, depict that visual schedule. Um, and if you notice, the file folder on the right has a red square around an activity. That is to draw the attention to the child that that is a current activity that mm -hmm. is going on. Um, because sometimes kids will see their preferred activity and pick that up, like, okay, this is what I want to do. So with the red visual square around that icon, it draws their attention to that. And you can say, oh, no, we're doing the red square right now. You can see that the activity you want to do is after, you know, and then whatever other activity it is. Right. And if it's choice making, then you could just present them only with the choices exactly. that are possibilities for that time. Exactly. And you know what, Deb? This would be great to use in conjunction with that time timer. Absolutely. So you could put the amount of minutes um, for each of those activities mm -hmm. um, to give them even more structure. Terrific. So those are great ideas that I could use with my students. Because we do a lot of transitioning from activity to activity. Those picture schedules and timers would be great. Um, and I love that some of those items you can make yourself. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to save money. What can I make for my kids, though, who have physical issues that make it difficult for them to do puzzles, play games, or even turn the pages of a book? Ah, so doing it yourself being I yeah, love, I love that. <laughs> my favorite thing. Um, so some ideas for doing it yourself is, um, let's say, puzzles. One thing you can do is you put Velcro dots on your puzzle and you create a Velcro wristband for the child. So they, instead of having to grasp or pull up a puzzle piece, they can just put their wrist down, Velcro to Velcro, and pick up the puzzle pieces that way. Oh, like Carlos, who has the weak breath. Exactly. So that might work for Carlos. Or maybe for Carlos, you want to do a magnetic of a wooden knob on the puzzle that you can buy at a cabinet store. Um, and you screw those onto a wooden puzzle, and then you can grasp the bigger knob to do the puzzle. Another thing that's really fun for do-it-yourself is magnets and magnet tape. Um, so for example, take your cookie sheet that is magnet. Uh, using magnetic tape on the back of poker chips, you can do a tic-tac-toe game. You can also use magnets. Um, they have printer paper that you can buy at office supply stores that goes through your printer that's magnetic on one side and white on the other. So you can create your picture icon. Oh, and use the cookie sheet as an icon. The, the Correct. Base. Or whatever you need it to be. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot you can do with magnets as well that are fun and easy to, to, to explore. Another thought you can do is, again, oh, there's back a knob. with knobs. Is right. Put that's them on, for Carlo. Right. Put it on a wheeled vehicle. Um, with glue, and then he can zip around the cars with the other kids without being frustrated that he can't get the car to go where he wants it to go. Oh, great idea. Um, another thought is a uh, magnet tape, which you can buy, on, on, put it on a toy car. And taking a magnetic wand that you can buy at a science supply store or so even some early learning education stores, you can get this, the magnetic wands, and they use the wand or attach the wand to a glove and push the lawn, push the car around with magnets. Oh, that's also a really good idea. So these are some great ideas for toys. Now you had also asked about book adaptions. How do we adapt a book for these young kiddos? Um, there's a lot you can, can buy them. You can buy them adapted, but that's expensive. Yes. Um, and we're not for you know it's something you can easily do for yourself. Um, one thing a lot of kids have, and a lot of teachers express frustration is, is children get so restless listening to a story that they lose attention right. and well, those kids aren't processing exactly so how do you make it more interesting yeah. for them to keep them centered mm -hmm. into that story one thing you can do is you can add picture symbols with velcro into the story so that they you can then have that interactivity with the book when you're reading a book like brown bear brown bear what do you see and then you have the child pick up an object that for the next object. I see, you know, a blank looking, looking at, at me. Exactly. And then they can be interacting within that book and find the blank and oh good job. Put it in the book. Very good. So you get some more interactivity. You keep everybody's interest. Exactly. Out, right? Other you do is add textures in. You can also for children with physical disabilities, you can add things like page fluffers to make it easier for them to turn the pages. Like a little oh, pom pom? Um, one of those pom pom? Pom pom. It could be styrofoam. Oh, okay. You can add clothespins to each one so they can easily grab the clothespin. 
maybe a paper clip if you have those. Um, bubble wrap is always fun to add in. And the other thing you can do is a lot of kids are droolers um, because they don't have the ability to close their mouth. Um, maybe you want to put plastic sleeves on the pages. Oh, to, to protect the, to protect the, the pages and it also makes it easier then for some of these things to grasp into the book and stay longer. Um, because again, in this age group you have to be aware of choking hazards. Really? So if you're going to put something more interesting underneath on the page, you want to make sure it's not a choking hazard. So if you put the page then in a plastic sleeve, the interest is still there, there's a still a buildup, they might they can still touch and interact. But they're not going to probably cook. supervise the oh, child absolutely. Just them working alongside the child with these books. Absolutely. So does anyone else, if anyone else have any suggestions or ideas for things you've done in your classrooms or that you know of that people have done uh, for adapting things, please put them in the chat box. We'd love to be able to share them with everybody because there's so many great ideas out there of things you can do to adapt that other teachers may have done. Um, also, there's resources for Simple AT. Um, there's actually something that just came out at the end of last year called EZAT2. And it's Simple Assistive Technology Ideas for Children ages birth to three. And it's a booklet that you can download from pacer.org. And I've got the website listed. Um, there's also the Let's Play project um, from letsplay.buffalo.edu and they've got a whole list of teacher and parent generated ideas for adapting the world for their kiddos. And I see here one of the other uh, participants uses a lot of puppy paint to oh, create that texture. Cool. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, fabulous. So that's another thing you can absolutely do to create that texture and that interest. Okay, uh, I'm really inspired by all these ideas, but I but I keep going back to that process. Um, how does one go about selecting assistive technology? Well, there's some best practices in terms of selecting what tools are going to work best for your kiddos. Um, you want to first gather your information. That's so important. Um, you want to work closely with the family and with other members of the team. A lot of your kiddos may be uh, participants of blind babies or maybe they're CCS members. Make sure you work with those team members as well. They may not be in your classroom, but if you can connect with them as you gather information about that child, um, you may find, get some valuable tips that may help as you decide what's going to work best for that child. Don't just identify the child's needs, but also focus on their strengths and their preferences because that's going to be where you're going to be able to fit assistive technology in and make it work the best for that child. Well, I should have told you then that Carlos really likes music. Ah, oh, see, that would have been good to know because then you want to adapt something musical for him to play with, like a switch adapted toy that has music on it. True. True. So that would be fun for him. He'd enjoy that with a switch. Um, and then once you've gathered that information, then you generate your possible AT solutions for that. Um, so when I talk about that, when you try it out, you want to try it out with a child, you want to make it comfortable and fun. And be flexible. Kids have bad days, especially in this age range. Um, they can have maybe, maybe they didn't sleep well the night before, maybe they're getting a cold, maybe something's going on in the house that set them off and they're just having a bad day. So be flexible. Um, don't get locked into your schedule when you're trying out something new with these kiddos. Let's lock into their schedule a little bit because you want to make sure you try something new with them on a day when they're most open to new. And I know that you have a center here, the iTech Center, mm -hmm. um, where families and professionals can bring the students, right? Right. but it's not their natural environment. So. You know, how useful is that really? Well, what it does is it gives them an opportunity to try tools they may not have available in their environment. Um, but what, what happens here is we may see something that may work, but we then go and suggest they try to find a way to trial that in their natural environment. And, and where are we supposed to get well, there's the a great, equipment? They can check the AT Exchange website for loan equipment at exchange.atnet.org is one place to go to take a look and see is there a, a, equipment available, is this out there that I can borrow for two to three weeks and see if this works with this child. Um, and take note of successes and failures. Um, what works and what, what didn't work and why didn't it work because that will help lead you in the direction for that child. So you always have to consider the SET framework which is a term, let me explain what that means. SET stands for the student, the student's strengths and needs, 
the environment where the student is um, and where the student will be going, the task, what is it that the student needs assistance with, and then you look at the tools. Um, it's sort of the basic framework when you're considering kind of that with yeah. Carlos, right? Exactly. And if you want more information about the set process, you can go to the website listed at the bottom of this slide, the sbac.edu, the long website, <laughs> and get more information about that set process. That's, well, yeah, that acronym is actually very helpful in uh, reminding us how we should consider assistive technology for each student. Um, so what's the next step after we have selected the technology? Well, then you would write the AT into the goal. Assistive technology is not a goal in and of itself, but it's a tool you use to get to a goal. So for example, um, for these kiddos, for Carlos, um, using a jelly button switch hooked up to a battery operated musical toy, Carlos will learn how to purposefully activate a cause and effect toy. So do you see how it's written into the goal that's already existing? Um, another one, using uh, board maker icons and a sequencer, Carlos will communicate his choice of snack item. Okay, so maybe the original goal was Carlos will communicate his right. choice of snack item. And now you've had difficulty doing that in a traditional way. Mm -hmm. We've added the assistive technology right into the goal. Exactly. And then the same thing goes for IFSP. Um, Jordan will transition from one activity to another utilizing a picture schedule and a visual timer. So we have the goals first, exactly. then we add, then, then we consider assistive technology. Exactly. Okay. I think it's starting to make sense here, Deb. Good. But uh -oh. <laughs> another area that comes up a lot from the parents is computer software and iPads and iPods and apps. and. They all think this is the panacea. <laughs> what should I know about the higher tech stuff? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the software and the apps. And how do you know if a software or an app is a good software or app for a child? Oh, like features to look the for? Features to look for within that. Um, so what you look for is, first of all, is it simple and quick for the child to use? Um, you don't want something that's a multi-step to get to the end result for these kids because they're going to lose track, they're going to lose focus, it's not going to work. So simple and speedy is important. It has to have very clear, simple visuals as well. Um, if the screen gets too cluttered, a lot of the kids just get lost within the visuals and they lose, again, focus and track. So simple and clear visuals. It'd be great if it had recognizable characters or music or events that they recognize and understand from their own experience. Oh, so look at the child's preferences and exactly. see if you can find a software app that has those. Exactly. Um, it has, should have the software or the app should have a consistent and immediate response, going back to that simple and speedy. And you should be able to, as the teacher, have the option available to customize that software or that app to the child. So it maybe has several levels. Maybe you want the child to start at the middle level, not at the very beginning level, because they've already gone past that. Oh. Or maybe instead of having five choices available, have two. So you should be able to look for customization within the software. And maybe one app. where they where they can't escape. Exactly. Off the page. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. So um, some effective computer use for these age is you know uh, touch screens. And that's why iPads are so Im big in this population, is because you've got that immediate touch, something happens. Um, but you can also buy touch screens for a computer. You can have a touch monitor for your computer. So if you don't have an iPad in the classroom, it does not mean you cannot have that immediate response. You get a touch monitor for your computer, and that opens up worlds for some of these kids as well. Um, you can also, for computers, not for the iPad so much, you can add in switches with scanning software. For those kids who can't do the touch interface on the computer monitor, maybe they can hit a switch or use a wobble switch to access some great software that's available in freeware. So could I plug those switches in that you mentioned before right into the computer? You usually you have to go through a switch. You have to usually find a uh, device that is a switch port. So you plug the switch port into the computer and then you plug the switch into that port. Okay. Um, but they can be pretty inexpensive. I think the cheapest I found is $69. Okay. So they're not too much to do that. That's cool to have. Right. You can also have alternative keyboards. Um, colorful big keys on the keyboard for this age grade is nice. 
Um, or, you know, you can have a, your mouse or a, an alternative mouse, maybe a smaller mouse for those smaller hands that you're working with. All of these things are available on a computer. And for the iPad, you can have some switch. There are switches, Bluetooth switches for the iPad, but there's very few software programs. They're all communication based at this time um, that actually work with the switch. So be aware of that. So why are some children better candidates than others for computers? Um, why would some children want a computer? Well, for some children, um, they really like to be in control or they're very visual learners. Uh, like we all. <laughs> oh, <that's> true. <laughs> True. Wouldn't that be great? But like children um, with autism, children with Down syndrome, they're very visual learners. They like to be in control. They like to have that control. And so for those kids, it puts computers really put the child in control. For some children, it can simulate a play activity that the child otherwise could not do because of their disability. Let's say they have a motor difficulty and they can't do a traditional puzzle even with adaptions. You can get puzzle software that maybe they can then access and use to, to learn how to put the pieces together to create that whole, which mm -hmm. is such an important developmental uh, milestone. Um, it's also computers are re repetitious and predictable. And some kids really benefit from that repetition, especially children with cognitive challenges. They need that repetition. Um, there's a software program I'm aware of that one student, while the mom and I were talking in the center about other things, the child was looking at the picture of a bus, morph into an uh, icon of a bus, and say the word bus. And he did that over and over and over and over and over again. And all of a sudden, he said, for the first time ever, bus. So it encouraged, that repetition really encouraged him to come up with the verbal for it. And a real person would tire much oh, more much quicker than a computer <laughs> in that repetition. Exactly. It also provides opportunities for cause and effect, um, choice making, and early learning. And you know, computers are so motivating for so many kids. Um, it really does uh, assist in that learning. So let's look at some examples of some software. First of all, well, I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> Give us some examples of some software. Some great software for this age range is uh, MarbleSoft has a whole early learning suite that you can purchase. And what's really nice about this is it starts from the very, very simple, just identifying things, and it goes all the way to the, OK, now pick out the object uh, that is green. So it goes from what is green to find me the green object. Um, and it, it does it for colors, shapes, um, numbers, letters. Um, it's really nice. And you, as a teacher, can start them at their appropriate level. Also, this software is already set up for those who need to use switches and switch scanning. It can be used with a touch screen. So it can be used in multiple ways on your so computer. So that's something to look for when you're thinking about universal design for learning. Exactly. Um, also, there's another one called Words Around Me. And this particular software program is nice because you've got that very simple graphic or thing. And it has a built-in little green guy. And the little green guy is fun and motivating for the kids because he is your reward that's built into the software. This software also is fully customizable. You can start with one choice, go up to five choices on the screen. And they look um, like real photos. And they are real photos, which is great for some students who need that. And this is uh, this also come with Spanish? Yes. In, I think this one is also program. Spanish as well for yes. those who are bilingual. Another one is Old Max Farm. This is sort of an oldie but a goodie. Oh, um, Carlos would love that. Yeah, and it sings Old MacDonald's Farm. And they get to choose which animal are presented. And you can, you know, again, field out the number of choices that are available to them based on where they're at. And there's also activities built in that reinforces the learning of the sounds and the animals within this program as well. So it's just a lot of fun to play with that one as well. Those look great. And you know what I'm going to say, right? Yeah. Cha-ching, cha-ching. Yeah. Well, what about, <laughs> what about some free software? Ah, some great free software. Going back to books, let's start with books. The TarHeelReader.com is a great website to go to. It has free, easy to read, accessible books already set up on them. And by accessible, I mean they're already set up for switch users. They already have uh, voice built into them. So if you need to have them read out loud to the students, um, they can just go there, choose the book, choose the level of the book, and have that book read out loud to them. So it's a really nice website to go for free, accessible books. 
Star Fall is also fairly common for early learners. Um, I actually know about that one. Yeah, it's free. It's a website that you can go to, sign in for, and it, it helps you learn to read using phonics. Um, and as children travel down the road and have different activities that they can do to help them learn to read phonics. The nice thing with Starfall is it levels itself to the ability of the child. If the child is successful, it moves them on. If they're not, it keeps them where they're at until they are successful, and then it moves them on. It's a good program. Yeah. Good program. Another place to go is Send Teacher, um, which is a list of websites that have free downloads for teachers and parents of kids with special needs. It's also good for pre-K, those pre-kindergarten skills that you work on in your classroom. Um, so this is a really, really nice website. And then finally, there's a one that's great for teachers called kidsclub.com. And this is a great place to go to get printable learning resources for kids. So if you're looking for the big visuals that you can use with your classroom to laminate and Velcro and have that interactivity with, you can go to kidsclub.com. They probably already have it. So you just need to print it, laminate it, cut it out. You've got oh. your visuals already set up. Great. Um, and free is my favorite price. So if anybody else out there has any freeware or software they really like, please type it into the um, chat box so we can all share in that information as well. Um, and I do believe, for those who are asking about the PowerPoint presentation, it is going to be available to you um, at the end. I think they're going to send it around, or tomorrow they send it out to those participants. So for those who are like frantically writing and are getting hand cramps, I promise you will get this. <laughs> well, I think we can move on then. Uh, Deb, uh, I know my next question is going to be about apps. So yeah. are apps free? It depends. Um, some apps are free. Some have what they call a light version, which is free, but usually with ads built in. And then you can pay for a full version, and it gets rid of the advertisements. Um, and some you just buy. So when you see, you know, when I'm talking about some of my examples, I'm going to write if they have a light version, if they're free, or if it doesn't have anything, it means you just pay for it. Um, so let's start with Pocket Phonics. Um, Pocket Phonics has a free version that you can try, the light version. And what this one does is it teaches students how to read, write, and blend the letters using phonics. So it's a phonics-based reading and writing program. It's very simple graphics, easy to use for the students, and you've got that writing component, that handwriting component as well. So it's teaching them how to write as well as read and hear the letters. Um, another one that is free, and it comes with three free books, but in the app you can buy additional books, is Me Genius books. And Me Genius um, highlights and reads out loud age-appropriate books. By highlight, I mean as, the, as it's being read, the word that is being read out loud is highlighted in yellow. So they can track the words and they start making that word to sound mm -hmm. connection, um, which is so important in this age group, zero to five. Another great book for counting, learning to count, is Counting Bear. And I really like this book because it teaches the students how to count and sort using sight, touch, sound, and touch. It is customizable in that you, as a teacher or parent, can decide what pictures to use. You can even import your own pictures. So if you have, let's say, Carlos into music, you find out what music he likes best, you can use a picture of that music and your voice with that sound or that song underneath it as he counts. Or like a, a favorite character, like a Big favorite Bird. Character, Big you Bird. Count Big Bird. Exactly. Yeah. So that oh, I have someone in mind for that. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, and these apps are iPad. Some are I, I also available on the iPod Touches as well. So those are the little ones. The li yeah. Um, so many of these are iPod and iPad. They're both. You'll have to check. I think Counting Bear is just iPad, though. Um, families has Families 1 and Families 2. Both have that light version, which gives you two or three different categories to work with, as well as the full version, which opens up the entire app for you. And this is to, learn, to help children learn how to categorize things. Um, so you say, let's say you have clothes, a clothes closet, and you have a bunch of different pictures around that clothes closet. The student has to take the clothes, that things that are clothes, and put them in the closet. Mm. Okay, to ca learn that categorization. Um, so uh, that's a really nice one. Nice free app is I Hear You, um, and it helps the student learn animal sounds. Um, this one, because it's free, is not as customizable, 
but it also can really work on cause and effect and pointing because if you want you can tell them okay point to the sheep and out of a field of I believe it's nine or twelve I can't remember exactly they have to find the sheep point to the sheep touch the sheep and then they'll see a big picture of the sheep a real sheep and it goes ba and they hear what the what sheep it sounds ba <laughs> And that's a nice one, not just for learning animal sounds, but for cause and effect and pointing practice. A fun one is the whole talking animal series. There's talking Tom, talking Ben, talking T-Rex, there's a talking robot. These are just a lot of fun um, because they encourage vocalization and interaction with the software. So what, the, what you do is you have one of these little animals on your, soft, on your iPad or your iPod Touch and you talk to it and it repeats what you said in a funny sounding voice. Uh, talking Tom is higher pitched, Talking Ben is lower pitched, the dinosaur is growly, um, but it takes whatever they've said, whatever noises they've made and repeats it back to them. And kids just love it. And adults do too, quite frankly. I play with it a lot. It's fun to play with. As well as just that interactivity. If you can pet the cat and it purrs, if you touch it too hard, it says, ow! And it makes some funny sounds. And it's just fun to play with um, for those kids. I can then, see how that would be engaging. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And then back to Alphabet, learning the alphabet. Alphabet tracing is a free app. And what it does is it teaches the proper way to write letters and numbers on the iPad. This is iPad specific as well. So if you use your finger or, or, your finger stylus. or a stylus, whichever you would like to use. Okay. Uh, you use finger or stylus on these. So these are just some examples of apps. There's so many. There's thousands of apps out there. I know that. Um, if you don't have the opportunity um, to come in um, to a center to try out the apps, here's some great websites you can go to get more information. Uh, here's somebody who says there's an app called Art Maker for the iPad, which is great for their five-year-old with visual and motor issues. So there's another one to be aware of called Art Maker. Thank you for that information. So where can I get more information about apps? Well, a4cwsn.com is a great place to go because not only do they have app reviews, but videos of the apps in action, which is terrific. So you can see the full app, all the features of the app in a video before you make the decision to purchase. Um, Ocali.org in their document archive has a bunch of different resources with apps sorted by category of learning need. Oh, that's very useful. Yeah, so to sort through, to filter through exactly. the category you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you can go to the goal, what is the goal area, and then try to find apps to fit that goal like area. Cause and effect. And then you can go to A4C to everything to look for a video of it to make sure it meets that child's needs. Another place to go is momswithapps.com. And I would go here. This is a developer group of family friendly apps. But what I love with momswithapps.com is they have free app Fridays. Were they free? Free. Did you say free? I said free. One app or more are available for free on Friday. Every Friday? Every Friday, except during holiday times, and I think they take a couple weeks break in the summer as well. So it's a great place to go. So check it out every Friday to see what their free app of the day is. Um, and try it out. See if it works. And then just another place just to help you get started is snapsforkids.com. It's got a getting started guide with apps and an app finder as well, which you, again you type in the goal area and it gives you some ideas of apps to look for, as well as app reviews. So here's some great wow. websites to go to. Well, Deb, or should I say Lady App, <laughs> I think you've successfully overwhelmed me. And I've heard this is what you do best. It is. <laughs> I really appreciate all this information. Uh, so where can I find you if I need more help? Well, you can always give us a call. Um, at P um, you can give us a call. We have a free, toll-free number for California residents, which is 855-727-5775 at the iTech Center. You can also always contact atnet.org in their information thing, and they can probably provide assistance as well for you. Are there any other questions that you have or anyone in the audience has? 